<clears throat> Welcome everybody. Thank you for coming here tonight. Um, my name is Danelle and I work here at the library and um, we are here tonight because Frank Gatto is going to give us a little talk um, about all sorts of interesting topics. There's, there's, he's going to quote some things that have um, words in them that, that we don't usually use in polite society, so I hope that's okay with everybody. Um, <laughs> the president uses them. Well, the president probably tweets them to people, yes. Um, but anyway, so thank you for being here, and um, thank you, Macy, with WCTV8 for coming and filming the thing and doing what you do every time, and it's wonderful. So if you need to see this later or tell your friends, hey, you missed a great talk, you can find it on Macy's website Perfect. soon. Um, and the library is only partially funded by the town. We rely on donations, so anything you can do to support the library is great. And um, let's see, what is there to say about Frank? Each time I come up here, there's like different stuff. So the one that, the little bio thing he gave us for this talk, um, by the age of nine, Frank Gatto had read every nonfiction book in his town's children's library. The world was so full of facts to be mastered. Why read made up stuff? Upon entering law school, however, he realized that on the anvil of justice, truth was malleable to, which, to whatever fiction the law's hammer could beat it. Preferring the illusion of truth to, his, to its counterfeit, he turned to literary study. Today, two decades past retirement from an academic consensus that truth is only a social construct, he'll talk with us about what adultery in stories from the Old Testament to the bridges of Madison County reveal about us. Birds do it, bees do it, even educated fleas do it, let's do it. In Spain, the best upper sets do it, Lithuanians and let's do it. The Dutch in old Amsterdam's do it, not to mention the Finns. Folks in Siam do it. Think of Siamese twins. Some Argentines without means do it. People say in Boston that the beans do it. Cold Cape Cod clams against their wish do it. Even lazy jellyfish do it. So let's do it. Let's fall in love. Well, it's not as easy as or uncomplicated as Cole Porter would have it, and I'm sure we're all mature enough to understand that. We tend to assume that uh, words always mean the same thing, but as some of us who follow the Supreme Court know, it's not always true. Um, words change, and the concepts behind them change. And we would, surprisingly, even a word like adultery, which is in, uh, inscribed in the Ten Commandments by the fiery finger of God, has changed its meaning. So I'd like to talk a bit about that, what has happened. The difference between love and lust, and uh, the difference in meaning of the word adultery itself. Uh, it's, um, if we look at the Old Testament, which is the foundation of so much of Western thought, so much of Western practice, we see that Adultery is looked upon as a crime, but not a crime against the woman. It's a crime against property. It's what one should not take. There are two commandments that have to do with adultery. Thou shalt not commit adultery, but also thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. Because coveting is bad because it leads to action. And what is that action? It's a socially destructive action. It's a, an action that causes a disarray in society. And that is really the, the main uh, uh, lesson that we have there. And we have various stories in the Old Testament which illustrate that. Let's take the story of Abraham and Sarah, or uh, Abram and Sarai. The Jews in the Old Testament are always changing their names. Um, uh, the instruction of God, to be sure. Uh, what, we, um, uh, what we have here is a case where, like many other families in the Old Testament or alluded to at the period, in the period, where the wife, because she is barren, asks her husband to fulfill 
the uh, obligation he has to the future of the family by taking the handmaiden as his uh, bed partner and trying to conceive with her. And indeed in Jewish law there was no difference in the way in which the offspring of such a meeting would be treated uh, because the handmaiden was seen as the extension of, uh, of the prime piece of property which was the wife. Uh, and if we look at Abraham's or Abram's conduct before uh, that, we don't see the most exemplary kind of behavior at all. Remember that uh, Abram tries to uh, fob off uh, Sarai or Sarah on Pharaoh. And it's Pharaoh who says, finds out that, no, this is, you said this was your sister, and it's not your sister, it's your wife. And at that point, Pharaoh has the higher moral ground, at least in our perception. And later on, Abram does the same thing again uh, with um, Abimelech, Abimelech uh, who uh, again says, no, this is your wife, you tried to disguise that from me. So that the notion of a man having sex with a woman, not his wife, is not at all seen, like, seen to be uh, 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 adultery. Uh, we, have, uh, we have other examples. Uh, let's take, uh, well, let's, let's move to, to something else, which is, which is uh, the story in the Old Testament of, uh, oh, I'm drawing a blank. Um, oh, for heaven's sakes. Help me, Gomer and Hosea, right? <laughs> okay. Um, in which uh, God commands Hosea to take an adulterous woman, to, not an adulterous woman, to take a promiscuous woman, a prostitute, a whore, and all those words are found. Uh, the ex excuse that seems to be that God thinks that the people of Israel, the people of those tribes, uh, deserve punishment, and so uh, uh, Abram, uh, uh, Hosea will, in a sense, stand as their surrogate, and he will have to suffer the, uh, the, uh, the problems that come with having a promiscuous wife. You know, I don't buy that. And it also doesn't seem like a very rational thing for God to do. This may be simply a way in, in the course of transforming a, an historical fact or the behavior of a figure uh, in the story, uh, transforming it uh, into something that m sort of excuses the, the, the behavior that, uh, that is about to be outlined. But at any rate, Hosea does marry a woman who is known for being quite promiscuous. And then uh, along the way, after they're married, she goes off with someone. Uh, we don't even know the name of the man she goes off with, but apparently she's quite willing to be with him. And Hosea, very, very upset about this, goes after her and finds her. And presumably because God has told him that he must have this woman and keep this woman, uh, but it's also said that he loves his wife very much. So he tries to recover her from, uh, from the man who owns her. And the man says, well, she's here, she's... She's, she's happy here. Uh, she's now my property, not, not yours. Uh, and Hosea says, well, I'll give you the standard price. What is uh, 30 shekels, 30 pieces of silver? Seems to be a magic biblical number, 30 pieces of silver. And then he says, but I, I don't have 30 pieces of silver. Would you take 15 bushels of barley uh, and, uh, and 15 uh, sh uh, shekels? And they agree that that's, uh, that's okay. He doesn't have the full quota of barley that he needs to supply him with, so uh, he gives them half a bushel instead of a whole bushel to, make a, to, 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 to complete the, uh, the deal. And the man accepts it, and he brings his wife back. And presumably, she continues in her promiscuous behavior because she's not even mentioned again. Um, but the story that we all know and all remember, and certainly has made Hollywood richer, is the story of David and Bathsheba, right? Uh, let's think about that story for a moment, as you know. David goes out, looks out in, in the moonlight, and he sees this beautiful woman bathing, and uh, wants to know who she is. He's, he lusts after her, so he sends a messenger to talk to her and bring her back. And she's brought back, 
and he sleeps with her. He has sex with her. Uh, and now what is he going to do when uh, you know, she, she's pregnant? Well, what, she's, what he's going to do is try to hide the fact. So he calls one of his uh, assistants in and says, uh, you know, bring her husband back from, uh, from battle. Comes back. David speaks to the husband, whose name is Uriah. And he says, well, Uriah, you've really been fighting. It's tough, dirty work out there. As a reward, I'm going to have you join your wife. Night falls, and Uriah doesn't, doesn't take advantage of this great opportunity that David has given him. And he calls him back. Why did you not do this? And it happens the second night. Why did you not do this? He says, well, my men are suffering in the fields. I would feel guilty lying with my wife while they are exposed to this kind of danger. So David's plan has been thwarted. So he calls in uh, his commander, Joab, and he says, I uh, uh, want, want you to attack, and I want you to put uh, Uriah in the part of the battle where he is most likely uh, to, uh, to suffer death. And Joab does this, and sure enough, Uriah is killed. So now David is free to marry, or to take as, as his wife, Bathsheba. Now note, along here, Bathsheba has, Bathsheba's attitude towards this has never been recorded. The story doesn't tell us that she enjoys this, wants this, is flattered by uh, the attentions of the king. Because to the teller of the story, it doesn't matter whether she liked it or not. And maybe the person who hears the story would not even be move to ask, hey, how did, how did this woman feel about it? You know, how did she feel about uh, committing adultery uh, against, her, um, against her husband? It's not part of the story. It's not relevant to the story in the way that the story is framed, and the listener of the story is meant to take this. Then Nathan comes to see David, and he says, I know what you did. It's the wrong thing. God will punish you. But God is not going to punish him for the adultery. God is going to punish him for having killed Uriah. Now, uh, I, in doing some research for, uh, for this talk, I discovered that there are a, a number of commentaries. They want to excuse David because of his prominence in Jewish history. And they say, yep, yeah, but you know, Uriah was a Hittite. He didn't count. He wasn't a Jew. He wasn't one of us. It, it, you know, she's, free. she's free for anybody who wants to take her. But that doesn't excuse, of course, the fact that he has, that, that he, David, has deliberately caused the death of someone because of his desire to commit adultery. And that's where his sin lies uh, in, uh, in um, uh, in, in misusing his desire and uh, at the uh, expense of another man's life uh, satisfying it. Well, our tradition is Jewish, but of course it's not wholly Jewish. What we see happen, of course, is that J Judaism is reformed and it becomes Christianity. But before we get to that, we should take a look at that other component in our civilized background, which is the Greco-Roman past. How were women seen? Well, how were, how were uh, sexual relations between man and wife uh, defined? What kind of obligations were there? Well, here again, we see something of a surprise. Because the woman still doesn't count for very much, what really matters in the offense of adultery, which is uh, uh, translated as um, Ugh, it's, a, it's a bad translation to say adultery. Here, my notes are all mixed up. Um, excuse me. Um, here we go. The Greek word is moikeia. And moikeia is not quite the same thing as adultery. It's broader. You commit adultery if you take another man's sister, not just his wife. And what we have there is a concept of these close relationships, family relationships, as being really in the form of property. And property which has a bearing on one's pride. 
In Greek civilization at this time, pride is everything. Um, you know, the reason that, that the Greeks have got to snatch back Helen of Troy, who was incidentally had other men besides her husband Menelaus, is not because of a, so much of a, of a, 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 a disobey, disobey, disobedience sorry, of an injunction against a, a, a forbidden sexual relationship. It's because, because Menelaus's pride has been insulted and he has to wreak vengeance upon the man who has done this, who has taken uh, this, um, this woman. Uh, this most beautiful woman in the world, as, as, uh, as Homer describes her, this uh, daughter of Leda and daughter of Zeus. Remember that Zeus, in his lust, the Greek gods are no less, no less lustful than human beings, uh, transforms himself into the shape of a swan and rapes uh, Leda. And the word la rapes is a loaded word from our point of view. He takes her. Her will doesn't matter in this at all. In fact, she should be flattered because this is the head god. Uh, and and uh, Leda also, I don't know if it's the same day, but at the same time also has sexual liaison with her earthly husband. And so there we get that combination of the divine and the human. You know, she's divinely beautiful and uh, a worthy prize uh, for, uh, for a king. Um, so uh, seduction defined almost as codified in, in Athenian law as the seduction of a free woman. The seduction of a free woman. The distinction between rape and seduction is not really made. Uh, in fact, a seduction, what we would consider a seduction, is considered worse because the woman... Uh, you're not as offended if it's, if it's lust for the woman that overcomes your reason. If you seduce, you intend to take this woman who is another man's property or that belongs to this concept of his pride, of, of what makes him a man worthy of respect in that community and thereby trying to lessen him in the eyes of all. And so you've got to get back to him. It's interesting that most of the accounts of, of uh, what people did sexually and what punishments there were for sex in, in the writing of Greece come to us through comedy. And uh, the punishments for an adulterer uh, were to humiliate him. You know, he's offended somebody else's pride, so the, the, the uh, proper punishment is the humiliation of the man who has committed that. And among the, um, among the um, punishments recorded are having a man ride a donkey backwards, uh, looking ridiculous. The shaving of his pubic hair, and it's thought, at least those who comment on this, that the reason for the shaving of the pubic hair was to make him more childlike and therefore reducing his claim to, to manhood. And perhaps the most exotic uh, punishment that's ever been devised, which was to, uh, was to insert a radish in the man's anus, uh, which of course would cause great burning, but then and also cause him to behave in a ludicrous way and therefore he would be, uh, be laughed at. Now we speak of the classical period as Greco-Roman. What about the Romans? Uh, uh, in the time of the Republic, after the, the, the kings. Well, we see there is a society that we, I think we should look on <clears throat> with much greater favor because there women were seen as partners. They were seen as human beings, having rights, having emotions, having feelings. A woman was supposed to help a man uh, and be his, uh, his assistant in life in terms of fulfilling his um, ambitions. And that sexual egalitarianism extended throughout society. The focus here now was on the family. Uh, the Romans believed at the time, the time of, the re, of the Republic, early, middle, and late, uh, that, um, that um, one should uh, uh, one's place in society depended upon the standing over the family, and everything should be sacrificed to that. That society 
in large was a consortium of families. Uh, and so that we see this in a much greater way than with, in Greek society or certainly in Hebrew society. We see this emphasis upon family. Uh, the younger and the, the older you were, uh, I'm sorry, the higher you were in society, uh, the, the, uh, the younger the bride. And the reason for that was that uh, you wanted this woman to start having a family as soon as possible. So interesting social patterns. Virginity becomes important, uh, again, for those family reasons, not because of any uh, notion that sex itself is bad, but to ensure that once a woman reaches the age which she has, once she reaches puberty, that she should begin having families and thereby uh, increasing the potentiality for upward movement in the hierarchy of that, um, of that society. And here we have the definition of adultery as a married man having sexual relations with another man's wife or unmarried daughter. Not just, the sister drops out of the, out of the, uh, the field here. But you, <clears throat> if you uh, have sexual relations with another man's unmarried daughter, you lessened her value as a potential wife uh, and uh, thereby uh, were subtracting from his possibilities for aggrandizement through family. Uh, the punishment varied at different periods of Roman history and it often depended upon the circumstances. More and more what had originally been seen as a violation of religious principles basic moral principles uh, that have uh, their uh, origin outside of the human community uh, be become matters for legal uh, uh, settlement, that you bring this kind of thing to, uh, to a court. Though married, a woman remained legally part of her, hus of, her, um, of her own family, not her husband's family. Divorce was quite easy. So there was no real excuse for going around and disrupting somebody else's property. If you no longer wish to stay with your wife for whatever reason, you simply divorced her. But she also had the same rights in regard to the man who was her husband. If either party wished to terminate this, uh, this marriage, uh, it all that had to be done was a simple filing for divorce. You didn't even have to have grounds. Uh, and uh, she had a right to a portion of her diary back, uh, although if she committed adultery, that portion of her diary, which was legally hers, was uh, diminished. It was a, um, it, in many ways, uh, uh, one of the most favorable arrangements that we can imagine, given the conditions of antiquity. But the Roman Republic was a great success, and, and um, it became very prosperous. And one of the things we see in history is that prosperity, which increases leisure time, leads to uh, a rather severe laxity in the conduct of society. And that's what happened at the end of the Republic period. And we see with the rise of Augustus an attempt to do something about it. And it is said that the Lex Iulia having to do, <coughs> excuse me, with adultery was directed against the spread of adultery among married women. Uh, the, 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 the proliferation of extramarital affairs and that this had very deleterious effects on society. That people were not just getting a divorce, that they remain married but then sleep around. Uh, there were punishments. Uh, connected with, uh, with uh, um, adultery, and the, uh, mostly by custom, but the Lex Iulia, <coughs> instituted by Augustus, made these formal and made them and, and, and imposed rather strict requirements. If a father discovered a, a <coughs> excuse me, if a father discovered a married daughter, his own daughter, committing adultery in his house, importance of the notion of the house, or even in the son-in-law's house, you know, if she did it out in the field, it wasn't as severe. But if she did it in the house, he was entitled, he, the father, was entitled to kill both lovers. 
But, now look, that's the thinking behind the law. If he killed only one, he, could be, he himself could be charged with murder. Right? So that, there's an intricate psychology in, in terms of the conduct of society uh, associated with that. A wronged husband, not the father now, but the husband, was entitled to kill just his wife's lover if he was a slave or an infamous, which is to say if somebody who is free but is in a disreputable uh, occupation, like being an actor. <clears throat> um, now remember, the wife is under the father's protection, and so uh, you know, the, it is the father's business to visit judgment upon the daughter. If the husband killed the lover, the husband had to divorce his wife within three days, specified in the law, and have her formally charged with adultery. If neither lover was killed, then both could still st face very stiff penalties. Confiscation of half of the man, the lover's uh, uh, property, and uh, in her case, she could lose a third of her property in her own name and half her dowry. But she was also barred ever from remarrying. If a husband, interesting, if a husband was aware of the affair and did nothing, he himself could be punished for being a leno. Interesting, I finally realized the derivation of or the, the ancestry of Jay Leno's name as a leno, or which is the Latin word for a pimp, because he was he was <laughs> by his laxity was sort of encouraging this kind of behavior, and uh, this was seen as a very bad thing. Now, that, the traditional interpretation of the uh, Lex uh, Iulia having to do with adultery has been that you know, adultery and sexual misconduct had gotten so far out of hand that something had to be done to reign in society. And Augustus was very, very conscious of the need to to restore order. I mean, let's face it, society was starting to fall apart. Uh, perhaps the advent of the empire was inevitable, given conditions, the corruption, and, and you know, the, the stuff that we see in our society today. Um, uh, and something had to be done, and so we went to a law and order proto-emperor. He wasn't yet, didn't take the title of emperor yet, but anyway. Um, and so, uh, uh, he instituted these moral laws to try to get some control on society. But in the, in the previous century, the latter part of the previous century, at least according to things that I, that I found on the internet, um, there, some, some interpreters of, of history have put forth a different explanation, maybe rooted in the same urge, but nevertheless taking somewhat different form. That, what, that since everybody was sort of, run, not everybody, but since uh, adultery was so rife, that by having a law against it, Augustus forged for himself a very powerful tool so that he could charge somebody with adultery and then who was politically uh, um, uh, inimical to his own interests and thereby get him out of the way. So, you know, you charge, uh, uh, you know, Enricus with, uh, with adultery, and, and then you can ship him off to some island somewhere. Ironically, and this, led, this was one of the things I discovered in the course of my research for this talk that, I, that really broke my heart. Augustus had one daughter. Uh, he didn't have, and he had no male, uh, no male children. And this was his favorite daughter, and apparently she was one of the most gracious, lovely, sweet, tender, solicitous, charitable, loving women that anyone had ever known. And that extended, unfortunately, I suppose, to the sexual realm. And she was, I, I think, from the little that I've read about her biography, it was probably because of the, the wives that, um, that Augustus took, who were very jealous of her and were uh, really very, very mean to her and tried to circumscribe her life as much as possible. And I guess her response for this, seeking love, acceptance, and so forth, was to sleep with just about anybody who would have her. And perhaps apocryphally, it is said that, that uh, at the end of her life, um, she was just making herself available for, for 
few coins to anybody who walked by. But before that, the father had, to, according to his own law, had to, ex had to wreak, pun wreak punishment on his daughter. And so she was um, confined on an island of Pan Pandateria, and, uh, which was uh, uh, just about one kilometer square. And you can imagine what life was like there. And she was there for two or three years until finally he, the emperor himself, went there and saw how terrible it was and said, okay, we're going to change this. And she was allowed to move to Torreggio in Calabria, which was uh, not as, uh, as harsh uh, a punishment. But uh, certainly her, her life was not a happy one. Okay. It's, uh, we're now at the point at which there can be a conjunction, really, of these uh, two traditions, and a new tradition emerged out of them, which is the tradition of Christianity. Let's remember that Jesus was an Essene Jew. At least that's what everyone agrees on today. And the Essenes believed that the world was coming to an end soon. And concomitant with that belief, the notion was that you had to prepare yourself for what Christianity held out, as an afterlife, that this life, with all of, its, uh, all of its difficulties and pain, was simply a testing ground, a preparation, uh, a shriving in some ways, for, for our eternal lives. And so that became the emphasis. And the most important, perhaps the most important uh, founder of Christianity of all was uh, St. Was Paul. And in the sexual era, you will remember that Paul said, it is better to marry than to burn. It is better to be celibate. It is better to have no sexual relations at all. He wasn't worried about future generations and families because the world was going to end pretty soon anyway. Um, and so the emphasis is on, on your concentration of leading the good life and being redeemed because Jesus and the way of Jesus would lead to everlasting life, to eternal life. Um, and uh, you know, there were consequences uh, for this reconstruction uh, of, um, of the world, of the <coughs> and the conduct of life. Marriage was now a sacrament. It was now not to be a divorce. It could be an annulment, but it was a refinement brought along later. But the emphasis was on leading a good spiritual life, and there should be no distractions. And as we all know, uh, sexual appetite can be a powerful distraction. Uh, and so that's where the, uh, the emphasis uh, led. Well, at about this time, or shortly, there, not shortly thereafter, the empire is clearly on the way down. The emperors become more and more corrupt. Society becomes corrupt. Society gets very soft. Rome is ripe for a fall. And in the latter part of the fifth century, Rome finally does fall to the Vandals. Now, the, you know, what we have then is that chapter called the Dark Ages, which were probably not so dark at all. What happened was the government just collapsed, and we had you know, home rule everywhere, and men reverted to much more simple lives. The kind of ambition that ruled Roman thinking about the family was, was out. One, there was not much that one can be ambitious about. What about the sexual uh, relations between man and woman, when, as we know, if you were, uh, were uh, at the bottom of the social scale, the man who, whom you were uh, tied to, who in effect was a kind of owner, your owner, uh, had the droit de seigneur, he had the right to sleep with the, with the wife, uh, with your bride, um, before you uh, could make her your own. And that was simply accepted. This is a, an understanding that power rules, and everything is defined in terms of who, <coughs> who controls the power, and there's nothing much you can do uh, to, um, to rise up against it. The church itself, which is, becomes a, a very obvious and uh, uh, formidable source of power, uh, starts to become corrupt. You have reactions against that, uh, a rise in monastic life, you know, for which we should be eternally grateful for so much of what was retained, the records of the past, of, of uh, the good things that men in society uh, had done. Uh, but society is, is, is in a period of retrenchment and retreat. 
Um, the, the, the next figure I'd like to talk about, or development I'd like to talk about, is that of courtly love. The term courtly love is really a rather recent invention. It's first used in the 19th century. Um, and it's not the best translation of what uh, codes were really developed. Who developed them? Well, we don't know, but they are associated with Eleanor of Aquitaine. I don't know if that name is familiar to, to all of you. Really quite a remarkable woman. She comes from the south of France, one of the few places in Europe where women are respected uh, as intelligent social uh, beings, where they have rights, where their their um, talents and uh, value as human beings is uh, respected, and Eleanor certainly um, uh, absorbs all that in her early education. And she does, and her father does educate her. She gets the best tutors, she's well read, she's introduced to music, she studies mathematics. Um, she's truly a, a remarkable woman, and she's not going to be pushed around by anybody. Um, she's the only woman I know of who was queen of two countries. First France, when she married Louis, uh, and that marriage didn't work out for various reasons. One, I suspect, was because uh, Louis couldn't hold the candle to his wife in terms of, uh, of reason, in terms of cultivation, in terms really of what one wanted to get out of life. And so, because she was, she was unable to produce the male heir, which was needed for the, the, uh, the crown, uh, after uh, 15 years, that marriage was annulled. At first, uh, the application went to the, to the pope for an annulment, and he refused to do it. He said, no, this is very important. You must stay together. Married, marriage is not to be dismissed lightly. Well, we've been together for 15 years. And Louis says, I've got to produce a male heir. She can't produce a male heir for me. And he said, well, try. And actually, it's, the story is that Pope Eugene actually designs a bed and says, OK, you know, do it in that bed. And, uh, and she does conceive, but it's a girl. It's the sec second child she has. It's a girl. And girls didn't count back <laughs> in terms of being queen of France. So he finally agrees to annul the marriage. And so she, at the, within a couple of weeks of the, of the annulment, she, uh, she not only is engaged, but she gets married to the Duke of Normandy, who two years later becomes King of England. I see you nodding in the audience there. You remember your English history having gone to a good prep school, right? <laughs> so <laughs> anyway, so she becomes Queen of England. So this, but wherever she goes, this woman brings a court together, and she wants to encourage cultivated pursuits of of uh, literature and, and, and the, f the finer things. Uh, she also does apparently have or institute something called the Court of Love. Um, but this is only recorded in, by one historian, a man named Andrew Kapolanis. Uh, it, it is not uh, confirmed anywhere else, and this has led to some questioning as to whether it actually did exist. Um, and if there were disputes of of lovers, they would come before the court of love and have uh, the views of four women, Eleanor, her daughter Maria, and two other, one was a viscountess and another was, I've forgotten now, anyway, um, and they would, they would hear your case and decide it. And famously, they decided the question, can true love exist in marriage, because this was brought up to them. You know, or was something is true love only the cor <coughs> the uh, the course of of a, of a romantic relationship outside of marriage? And these four women decided the the answer to that question was no. It cannot exist in marriage. That marriage was really for for um, other purposes. And this was, but all this was very much in line with something that is attributed to Eleanor. The idea and his attempt now to reconcile to reconcile uh, one's desires with what the teachings of the church are. Because you don't want to violate your chances for eternal life. You, it's, the, the church wields a lot of power, so there has to be some respect paid for its, its uh, laws and, and, uh, uh, and teachings. And at the same time, there's this desire to 
you know, find some enjoyment and fulfillment in life. So what was developed was this notion of courtly love, or what we've come to call courtly love, in which you dedicated yourself in the finest, the finest aspect of your love, and the French term was fin amour, uh, to, uh, the, uh, uh, the male did, to a woman, this exaltation of the woman, and there was not necessarily, in fact, there should not be any sensual realization of that love. You don't, go, you don't dedicate yourself to this woman for the sake of taking her to bed. Um, you do this because you value her as, a, um, uh, uh, as a, an earthly representation of an ideal. Now, this enabled you to have a relationship with women, an intimate relationship, which presumably was not sexual, but often was. But at least it gave you a cover. And the husband couldn't really object too much. And furthermore, the husband was very often uh, away waging some sort of battle, or some sort of, uh, of, uh, of war. To what extent did this court of love actually function? It's been suggested that it was only a parlor game, that it was a way for women to divert themselves, these four women and the court to divert itself. We don't know. But that it was at least lip service paid to it is very clear, because so much of the literature of that period comes, um, comes out in that way. Uh, all right, let me try to jump ahead a bit. Um, we see something of the codes of courtly love, the ideas of courtly love, uh, at, at the time of Dante. The most famous love story of the period is certainly that of Paolo and Francesca, which has, uh, has survived. And as we know, it's in the second uh, um, um, uh, level of hell. And we see people there who've been improvident, who've been um, uh, thoughtless in their love, who've succumbed to passion, and they are blown forever about, and uh, um, destined never to meet, never to get together again. As you probably know, Paolo and Francesco were actual people. Uh, Dante's use of them and the actual occurrences uh, are not exactly the same. What happened in that case, and tells you something about the custom of the time, was that, um, was that uh, um, uh, Francesca, who I love Italian names, uh, because they always mean something and they so often, uh, uh, there's an ironic or an actual reflection of their role in whatever narrative you read. Francesca's last name was Polenta, cornmeal, cooked porn, porn meal. And, um, uh, uh, her, uh, her family and the, the, another family called the Malatestas were rather sharp uh, and um, acrimony and, uh, and uh, contention. And so in order to, to try to heal this rift and this very destructive rivalry and, uh, and bring comity to uh, these two powerful families, a deal was made. And Francesca was married to a man who was something like 10 years older. Uh, and also most unfortunate was that this man, whose name was uh, Gian Gianciotto, which for some reason I always see, they have a parenthesis, which means in Italian, the lame. It doesn't mean that at all. It, doesn't, it means the Big Jack, uh, Big John. But anyway, that's neither here nor there. Uh, and so she was to marry him, and she did marry him. It was an arranged marriage. She didn't find happiness with him. In fact, the story, that, as historical accounts, starting with Boccaccio, developed that she had been tricked into this, that when she first saw her future bridegroom, that the family had, had uh, produced his younger brother. And his younger brother was quite handsome. And uh, it was not until after the wedding night that she saw, because she thought she was going in that night to uh, uh, to the man who turns out to be the, the younger brother, but that she assumed would be her husband. And then she found out no, that she really was married to this much older man who was also a humpback. The degree to which he was crippled is, is not known, um, but it was not at all what she was <coughs> had been dreaming of. And this affair went on for 10 years, with the affair between Paolo and the real Paolo and Francesca. 
it was not something that, as you might infer from reading Dante, that just happened. You know, in Dante, the, you have the two are there, and they're, re <coughs> they're reading the story of Guinevere and Lancelot. And uh, in, in that moment, uh, you know, there's a spark, and they make love, and, and in the middle of their sexual congress, uh, the husband comes in and sees them <coughs> and, uh, and kills both of them. Uh, in fact, what happened was that, that he had jumped out the window, but, or held on, he'd gone out on the ledge and actually had tried to hold on, and uh, then, uh, uh, well, something went wrong, and the husband found out that he was there and killed him. So anyway, but you, what, what Dante is trying to do is to transform that story to suggest something about passion, and passion that is unregulated. That, you know, Dante is saying that they deserve hell. Even though the marriage was arranged and it was not the dream marriage, still marriage has to be respected, no matter what the consequences. And you have to be able to regulate your passions no matter how, how uh, genuine those, uh, those, passions, uh, those passions are. Because otherwise you are not going to be, you are not going to make it to heaven. Uh, let me rush ahead just a little bit. And, uh, uh, and talk a bit about what happens in the 18th century. Because that is, I think, the beginning of what is truly modern. Society changes. We develop an urban culture. Uh, the city becomes important. We, we have, again, an increase in wealth, and that enables uh, society to educate its women. Women now know how to read. They know how to talk to themselves. Men prize women who are witty and uh, gracious and can help them um, uh, navigate the, uh, their way in society. And that is reflected in the literature. And we also have something very important occur, and that is the development of a middle class. And that changes the relationship between literature, writing, and society itself. Uh, and we see two attitudes towards, towards women. First is evident in the writings of Samuel Richardson. You know, we talk about the beginnings of the novel, and you say, who was the first British novelist? And some people will say Samuel Richardson with Pamela, and others will say, no, it was Defoe with, you know, his novels, Robinson Crusoe, and so forth. Well, that really speaking, it cross purposes. But what Defoe's writings show us uh, and is his interest in the fluidity of society and of how women can use their sexuality to advantage, how they can take advantage of man's, men's lust in order to improve their lot. Now, they may suffer along the way, they may get beaten up, they may, they, they may be cheated and fooled, but if a woman is clever enough, she can always use her body in order, and the appeal that it has, in order to rise in society. So we see success stories. In a curious way, Richardson is telling us the same thing in Pamela, a novel which swept Europe in great popularity and caused people to indulge their, you know, their sentiments, caused, uh, you know, um, um, uh, 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 Noah Webster, not Noah Webster, Samuel Johnson, I'm sorry, Samuel Johnson, who was a very, you know, uh, tough-minded man to weep, and uh, the rage for Pamela, right across Europe, down in Italy, people are writing, writing sad uh, plays for the theater about Pamela. What's really going on here? Pamela is a girl who wants to find a husband. She is, uh, she's off in a household with Lord B. Lord B is not anyone I would advise a daughter of mine to marry. All he tries to do throughout the whole book is to, uh, is to uh, uh, force uh, uh, Pamela uh, to, uh, to allow him to make love to her, to allow him to have sex with her. It's, it's a form of forced rape, really. And he tries the most ingenious ways and pretends that he's asked to marry her and he gets somebody to come in and pretend to be a priest and she fortunately just finds out in time 
Uh, another time, you know, she's hiding in the closet and he's banging on the door and saying, I will have you, I will have you. And she's meanwhile writing to her mother and somehow gets to mail this letter without saying whether he was successful or not. But after a, after a long time, the, the uh, it's, I can't say poor Lord B because I don't have very much respect for him. Um, but Lord B is worn to a frazzle and agrees to marry her. So she now has won her prize. His second book, which, is, which was even more successful, was Clarissa. And there we have, again, the same contention between the woman who wants to prize her virginity because that is her greatest asset. And the only question really is, will she get what she thinks that virginity uh, is, uh, uh, deserves? She finally does give in, but, and she's cheated, but that's not going to get her off the hook. The idea is that she finally has to, has to suffer, and so she dies at the end. That's the way the American novel begins as well, imitations of Clarissa. Uh, we um, we uh, aim at a female audience, and that female audience wants to see uh, itself in, its, in the female character, and wants to sense that, that the great sacrifice that the woman makes for a place in society, that is her virginity, her sexuality, that that is rewarded. If a woman missteps and picks the wrong guy, if she allows this fellow to have her uh, without sufficient resistance, she will get, inevitably get pregnant and she will die. And that's the story of the most popular uh, novels in America for the first old decade or so, even more than that. It's 7.30, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, do, you, do you want me to go on or do you? Yeah, all right. I'm, well, I'm sorry. Uh, huh? No? <laughs> what did you say? I'm sorry. Oh, Madison County. All right, well, that's, ju that's, jumping, that's jumping ahead a bit. If, but it, Updike, all right. Okay, very briefly, very briefly, then I, I will just one, one word about the 19th century, because it's also a very important period in which we see the woman in, in, in relationship to, um, uh, to a middle class society. And here again, it's a continuation of that notion, you have to control your passions. Two most, the two novels always cited uh, by historians of the novel as the, 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 the greatest novels of all time are Madame Bovary, and Anna Karenina, and they both give the same lesson. And one of the most important novels towards the close of the 19th century in the United States is The Awakening by Kate Chopin. I don't think it's as good as Moby Dick, uh, which uh, was the sacrificial lamb when, when uh, the feminist movement succeeded in changing the syllabi for most American lit courses. They dropped Moby Dick because it was too long, and they'd pick, up, uh, they'd pick up The Awakening. It's a good novel, but not in that in that class. It's sort of an American version of, of Madame Bovary. Okay, we'll get to the 20th century, and I'll talk very briefly about, about uh, Bridges of Madison County. Because to me, this is, this is almost porn, in my view. Uh, no dirty words, but, um, uh, you know, what does it say? Here we have a woman who's an Italian girl. She, she does have an affair before she marries. To, she marries an American soldier, GI. She comes home, she has a happy life. This is exactly what we find in, in, with, with Emma Bovary and with Anna Karenina. They both have happy lives and then something happens. Somebody comes in who really just stirs them and they throw everything out the window and as a result of that, they suffer. And uh, uh, but, so here we, we, we read that novel and we know from the first time that, what's his name, Robert Kincaid uh, shows up in his, uh, in his truck and the minute that he has a camel and he opens that pack, a camel, um, you know, which is the, the cigarette of really manly men, uh, and he opens a cigarette pack with one hand and takes out a cigarette and, and offers it to her, we know what's coming. But Waller just, you know, he, he holds back on it and holds back on it and holds back on it. Uh, we're waiting for the moment when finally she's going to go to bed with him. And finally she does, and this, as though this, this, this powerful river has been held back so long, of course it bursts. And he did nothing but have sex for, what, three days. And now how are we supposed to respond to this? Um, 
the way our emotions have been enlisted, we want her to get it on with this guy. And we want, her, we want to be able to say, well, she has realized the best that life has to offer, right? Uh, even, though, uh, even though she is violating her marital oath, even though she had a happy life, even though this husband she had was a decent guy, gave her all that she could reasonably expect, that still there's sort of a God-given right to have that one moment of licentious sex and you know, nothing but, but orgasm you know, continuously. And then it is put to her children to make a decision. Did she do the right thing? The children of the union with this kind of dull but decent uh, farmer. And Waller chickens out. He's not going to say one or the other. He's going to say, well, what, like, put the reader in a position of saying, well, whatever suits you and your happy resolution of this. But of course, we know what the answer is. The answer is, you know, go to it. Uh, that, 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 incidentally, her name is Francesca. Did you notice that? Um, and uh, her last name is Johnson, which is a form of Gianciotto, right? That's John. And it's been moved into, where is it, Kansas. So, no, Madison County is in Iowa, right? Yeah. Um, and the children get this, and they have to then pr pronounce absolution on the mother for having done what she's done. Now that they're adults, they too understand the code. That yes, we don't believe in adultery, but God, Mom did the right thing, right? Uh, <laughs> now, <laughs> Now let's look about at this book, which caused a sensation when it came out, uh, Couples. It's very autobiographical. Uh, I didn't realize this when I first encountered Updike, but I, I very slightly got to know him. Really very winning guy. And you, you read a little bit about his life and you understand that he did have a kind of problem with sex. He did not... Uh, he was not faithful in either of his marriages. Uh, and like his protagonist, was driven by this desire constantly to have a woman in his life who was not his, a woman in his life who was not his wife. And I remember reading this, what was it, back in the late 60s, something like that. And I didn't like the book at all. And I thought, well, all it is is very poetic and powerful, very well de 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 uh, described sex acts. And I'm tired of hearing about, reading about the blue veins on, on a woman's breast and, you know, and, and uh, you know, the descriptions of his penis. And so, you know, you, you know, in fact, I remember having dinner with him once and I said, don't you, know, don't you have a problem because you write a lot about sex and it's not all that different, one act from another and one body from, I mean, don't you get, this is really a challenge to, to try to come up with new ways of describing this activity? And he looked at me as though it was really odd and strange, and no, not at all. <laughs> you almost had the feeling he was saying, damn it all, I write these books precisely so I can write about sex in, in these poetic ways. Well, and it is a very, every rendering of a sex act in here is uh, very well described, poetically described, a, a display of magnificent language. You know, he certainly knows, knows his trade. Okay, that was my impression way back when. I reread it, reread it before I, I agreed with Kerry to give this talk, and then I've reread it again. And I understand that this is a sad, sad book and a terrible indictment of our society. Let's start with the protagonist, the, prota the projection of, of Updike himself. His name is Peter, okay? Piet in Dutch. And Updike's background was Dutch. And Piet is nothing but a sex machine in this book. That's all he does. He's not content with his wife, who's named Angela, and she is an angel. She would seem to be everything a man would want. But, he, but that kind of, of stability is not what he seeks. Um, his last name is Hanama. And as he's Dutch, I think old Updike knows Dutch from his family and a lot of use of Dutch in the book. 
Is that, what does the name mean? So the daughter of one of my classmates is a linguist who lives in Amsterdam. And so I explained to her what I was doing. I said, what does Hanuma mean? And she said, well, in Frisian, it means of the cock. What, what Americans have, you know, a word that if they, you know, offended by a change into rooster. Um, but, and that's what Piet is. I mean, he's, he, he seems driven by his maleness in that alone. Curiously, he's also the most Christian person, at least in terms of his thinking in the book. He believes in God, and he really does. And he's a Calvinist. But this doesn't seem to deter him at all from seeking sexual satisfaction wherever, wherever it is. Uh, at the very beginning of the book, we're introduced to Piet and, and the kind of life he's leading. And there's a woman named, um, named Garen, B-B-E-A, Garen, and she dances with him and she says, why won't you fuck me? And he doesn't really have an answer. Well, by the end of the book, or at the end of the book, he does. The first encounter, she says, you know, at some point you're going to need a friend, and I'll be there. And at the end, he needs a friend, and, he's, and he has sex with her, finally. Although you wonder, to what purpose? What has been achieved by this? And there's no answer. We start off, we have, we have described this town, Tarbox, which is also an extension of this notion of Peter Rabbit, and we know what rabbits do male rabbits do. Um, and we think of also of, of, um, uh, of, of Br'er Rabbit, another the famous, tar. pardon? The tar and the tar baby, which is where we get the tar from, and box, and we're told again and again. Now, is that box in the use, you know, to, to refer to a woman's genitalia? But it's also a word that appears again and again in, in the story in terms of what the, these people's lives are contained in. And this emphasis placed upon a cage that is built for the hamster of the, of the, of the girl, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, Piet's daughter. Um, and so it's, it's the tar baby, it, it, you get caught in and these people are caught. There's nothing, seems to be nothing beyond this life. They've run to this, this kind of suburban mode of living uh, as the realization of the American dream, and yet it's so empty. And by the time you get to the end of the book, and you get tired of it, everybody has slept with everybody else, just about. You know, I mean, have all of you read it? No. Yeah. No. No? Uh, well, be prepared. Uh, <laughs> so the, the emphasis is upon the church. The church, and the church has, has a steeple, and has a weather vane. And what is the weather vane? It's a cock. Right? I mean, the, you know, a, a male chicken. Uh, and and, and the, the, chicken has, the chicken has a penny for an eye. So, and, and people's lives are governed by financial questions. In fact, the, the minister of the church transforms his, uh, his images of Christianity into stock market transactions, you know? <laughs> and that's the way people are judged. But more and more, as you go along, you realize what a hell these people are living in. We have two couples who wind up, well, first they try to hide it from each other, that they're having an affair, that, you know, an excellent kind of affair. And then they say, well, you know, why are we hiding it? And so then they, they have, you know, sort of group sex. But that doesn't satisfy them either. either. The great battle is against boredom. And, and constant sex is not going to find, despite its momentary sensations, is not going to get them out of that sense of ennui. Uh, and, uh, you know, and ultimately, there's a kind of disaster. At the end, everybody's life is screwed up. And now, finally, Piet has married, and they didn't want to, uh, he's married the mistress, the last mistress he has, although he cheats on her too. Uh, and uh, the, the husband has dissolved, the husband of this woman, whose name is Foxy, has dissolved the marriage. So now Piet and Foxy move to another town, which is going to be exactly like Tarbox, you know. Um, and, uh, and, and, and meanwhile, they've had a, Foxy has been pregnant with her husband, and uh, I'm sorry, after having been pregnant. And the reason that, that Piet is so drawn to Foxy 
I think, is because she's initially pregnant by her husband. And Piet is drawn to those things which represent life. And, but then everything that is life turns into death. And so then he impregnates her, he, Piet, impregnates her. And well, she says, well, I can't have this. And so they arrange an abortion. And the abortion is arranged by the dentist who had wanted to be a doctor, but he, but he had not succeeded as a doctor, so he became a dentist. So when you know, she wants an abortion, they go to the dentist, who's a real bastard. You know, someone says earlier in the book, his name is Freddy, Freddy, and says, uh, uh, Freddy says, the world is divided in, in two. There are those who fuck, and there are those who are fucked. And Piet comes back and says, and you're neither. And that's true, because he's, he's, you know, he doesn't participate. He, all he can do is, is spout his vinegary statements. He's an observer. He sort of hates everybody. Uh, and then he becomes the guy who hooks up Foxy with the abortionist. So, you know, so, th there's, so there's a lot going on under the surface of this in terms of... In ter Updike is really, to my way of thinking, primarily a short story writer. And then the problem becomes, how do you create a novel out of the short story? But the organization is that which has been schooled by writing short stories. And you conclude the novel, let down because we're really right back we are, where we started, except worse. But also because it seems to mean nothing, and that's the conclusion that we come to about the meaning of life, that this is a really rotten way to live. Okay, that's a good point to stop is that on. How you Pardon? Is that what he believed? I think it is. Updike? Yeah. What do you think? Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Yeah. All his books are sad. All his books are sad. Um, Dry and sad. The other, the other rabbit is, of course, Rabbit Angstrom, uh, which starts off with Rabbit Run. Very, very sad book. And there's a lot of introspection there. You know, Rabbit, Rabbit is a son of a bitch in terms of what he does because he's all self-absorbed. What was up that like? I liked him a lot. He's just a very nice guy. Um, I, uh, we went to dinner in Schenectady at, I mean, looking for a restaurant for this guy. And the only place I could take him to in town was the Van Dyke, with a nice little you know, Dutch name. Um, and, and my idea of Van Dyke was that it, I, I've never been to a bordello in my life, but um, it, if, I were, if I were charged with designing a set for a movie about a late 19th century whorehouse, that's what I'd make it look like. <laughs> you know, it was, it was red velvet everywhere, you know, some small town idea of what opulence was. You know, candelabras. <laughs> You know, in, in most, most expensive bad taste, in that kind of place. And he, I, we walk in, and I was sort of apologetic, because I couldn't, I don't know, I don't remember why, because other restaurants were closed, or I'd forgotten the reason. But I was rather apologetic, the only place I could take him. And he walks in, and he goes, wow. <laughs> and I wanted to say, no, you're Robert Updike, you write for the New Yorker. <laughs> you know, this, but he was really impressed. Um, or maybe he was just a, polite. Say, saying thank you to you. No, I don't, I don't think so. I don't, it, it wasn't that reaction. He really was a very self-effacing guy. And he was, he was doing a reading uh, uh, at, this, at the college. He, he came for next to nothing. And he said, the only reason I came was because of your letter, which made me feel great. Um, and you know, he really came for peanuts, just almost nothing. And just before he went on, he started getting an asthma attack. And I thought, I'm going to have to go out and announce that he's not going to be able to read or speak tonight. Because he was, <gasps> you know, this uh, tremors and all the, and he said, oh, I'll be, I'll be okay, I'll be okay. And sure enough, he composed himself and he went out and he was, he was great. He was a very likable guy. He's, I felt towards him the way I'd feel towards someone who was a real friend, who I thought was a, um, an honest person, uh, tried to be honest with himself, but somehow had, had missed out on life. In some way, life wasn't what he wanted it to be. 
and, and was there, it was, he was therefore vulnerable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I want to ask that. I knew him too because he was a friend of my husband's in college. That's right, yes. And the two, the two of them really ran the Harvard Humor Magazine when they were there. Wow. My great was, cartoonist, great cartoonist. He was a marvelous cartoonist. He was an artist as well as a writer. And he couldn't, he, he married, his wife went to the Slade. He wanted to go to the Slade too, the, 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 Brit, the, the, the London Art School. Yeah. He was trying to decide whether to go to the Slade with his wife or become a writer. And he decided he was going to become a writer right. instead. But when he came to our house for dinner, he would simply monopolize the floor and, sp and spend the entire dinner talking. So I didn't see him as you saw him. I saw him as, a, as an arrogant guy who really knew that he, he was there to perform and he was going to perform. And maybe that was a sign of insecurity or something. But yeah, I, very I, articulate, spinning wonderful castles in the air. His, port, his, his writing is fabulous. His perceptions of art are incredible. His books of criticism are wonderful. Mm. But, it, but, but I agree with what you said. And he just, and my husband adored him and just, and just you know, had every first edition of every one of his books. But um, I found him extraordinarily narcissistic, mm -hmm. and um, and I, I didn't. He was he was just into me. Yeah. I felt. Incidentally, I think he's a very fine poet, yeah. uh, and he'd never gotten the, the recognition he deserves as a poet. He's really good, and you can understand what he's writing about too, what you can't say about all poets. But um, no, I, I if, if you're if you like if you like good poetry, look into Updike, uh, and uh, I think he would have preferred that he be re, uh, well regarded as a poet than anything else. Was Couples popular? Pardon? Yeah. Was Couples popular? Yes. Uh, so it was, well. um, but, but it's, it's been disparaged. Um, I, think his, I think his greatest achievement was the Rabbit series. I they're can't, all sad. They're all very sad, but then I think he sees life as sad. Mm -hmm. I think this is a man who really would have wanted to live under a benevolent God. I think he wanted to believe in a benevolent God, and because he didn't experience that, um, there was a kind of resentment and a seeking of punishment. Mm -hmm. I think there was a lot of, of self-punishment going on with him. He was a sexual addict, for sure. Yeah, uh, yeah. I, th I, I didn't want to say that, but I think that's true. Yeah. Um, Children? Yes. Yeah. And a good father. Yeah. Like he uh, loved his children. Uh, and, um, and the Maple, the Maple stories. Yes. Uh, the series in the New Yorker that really were autobiographical. Yeah. He, was, he was lovely with his children. You know, and I felt that was true. Didn't you? Yeah, you had the feeling he could make a story or found a story in almost anything. And, and good stories. He's very, daughter, a superb craftsman. Pardon? Didn't the daughter become a novelist? One of the sons did. That's it. But wasn't there a daughter who... I think you may be confusing him with Cheever. I don't know. I don't know Maybe. if it's done. Yes. Could be. Um, I think there was a son who wrote for the New Yorker for a while. Yeah, I don't know but that. I, not yeah. for long. Yeah. Um, now that I've closed, and I'm, I really want to apologize. I, I had I prepared for this, and I had a problem with the computer as a result of trying to to, uh, to follow instructions to have to make an, an appointment for a house reassessment or whatever it's called. And, uh, and I lost everything, and uh, so... Oh, this has been wonderful. Yes. I want to ask you, the word adulter adultery comes from adulterate, do you think? Yes, it, yes, it does not, right. It doesn't come from the same form of the root word as, as adult, which people sort of assume. It, it has to do with um, corrupting something, adulterate. Yeah. Adulterate. changing to corrupt, adulterate. yeah. Adulterate. Yeah. Adulterate. To adulterate, yeah. yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. Good. <laughs> yeah. Well, 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 it was, it was, I learned, <coughs> I learn a lot whenever I give a talk. I don't know, I guess I didn't learn anything when I gave a talk on Melville. But, um, but I, you know, one of the reasons Dara said to me, why do you do this? <laughs> you know, she's, you know, and she pays the price too, because at least in my vanity, I think she pays the price because I'm sort of withdrawn from her company for a while. And I think she feels that, um, and I feel guilty, but no, I do. Yeah, but but you know, uh, all. You haven't had any affairs, sweetie. <laughs> in my <laughs> in my in my life, my professional life has been that of a teacher, and and then as I say to people who ask me why did you retire, and I retired early out of terminal disgust. I couldn't stand what was going on; it, just, it was immoral. 
Um, but I do, although I have friends and, and I enjoy my friends, I don't have the occasion to do what, what I feel I'm trained to do and I like to think I'm fairly good at doing. And even though I've been away from it for a long time and I'm rusty. So, you know, it's, it's a, it, it drags me into looking, doing something more thoroughly than, than I could get away with. Um, but it, I learn a lot and I feel that, that joy that comes with learning. So, you know, you're my excuse. And it, I thank you for coming out because the last time I did this, was there one person here or no? I gave two lectures and it was, <laughs> yeah. So, but I don't, I don't mind that except, it's not as though I feel hurt or anything. It's just that um, it's, it's, well, you feel that you, you, you're speaking into the void. You know? And at least it, it, if you're talking to a person, then it, 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 everything, everything is justified. So I, I thank you. Sorry, I, sp I, I had to jump over all kinds. I've lost my sense of what an hour is. I didn't used to have that problem. But, but anyway, uh, there are all kinds of interesting things that I didn't bring in tonight. And one of the people you should look into, if you can find him on your internet, that I did not know about this guy, and I took courses in the 18th century and I've read the history, and I've never seen reference to him. A man named Peter Arnett, who talks about social bliss. And he is, he's not an atheist, he's a, he's a real Christian. Uh, he's, well, he's a deist, but a, a Christian deist. And he says, we're doing this all wrong with religion. That God is, God can only give us means to good. And he would not give us the means, the such pleasurable means, uh, if, if it were not part of his, his plan. Uh, you know, he doesn't say that we should abuse it. He doesn't favor uh, lying in order to have sex. But, but he talks about the importance of, of men and women who love each other. But that once that condition, and it's an honest condition, exists, that this is an expression, a means of love. And I thought, wow, I would just bowled over. It was hard to read. He doesn't write well. He has trouble with his sentences. They go on forever, and you, he sort of loses the subject along the way. But, but as an example of uh, what is happening in the 18th century, which I think is a fantastic century. You know, we're the children of the 18th century in the United States. And the, the, the sophistication of that process by which he is seeking to understand the, the meaning of life and what gives satisfaction and, and value to life. It really, was really quite impressive. So that was something I learned. Yeah. Peter Arnett, Social Bliss. You know, it's hard to read. But. What were his dates? Uh, 17, 1752 or something like that. He was British? Yes. Yeah. He was a schoolmaster. Um, and, uh, and he wrote, and there were people who were opposed to him, but, but you know, he exercised free speech. How about William Cullen Bryant? Is that a next talk? No, I, <laughs> then we, we'd cut the audience even more, but uh, buy the book, buy the book. Well, thanks again for coming, and thank you, Macy.